Hey everyone, welcome back to Mason Zero MTG. Another week, another magic set, am I right? Today we're looking at Bloomborough, which just finished its spoilers this week. I was pretty excited for this set from a visual and flavor perspective because, like many people it seems, I grew up reading Redwall, and this set really takes us back to those stories of brave mouse warriors fighting against evil vermin. But it turns out this set is more than just cute animals. It also has some really, really good cards, and I've assembled a list of 10 of them that I think should be considered for cube. So strap in and be ready to type in the comments if there are any cards I didn't mention that you plan on testing. When I saw Kitsa Otterball Elite, I knew it was going to be a winner in cube before I even finished reading the whole card. As a two mana blue looter, I first thought of Jace Vryn's Prodigy, which has been famously strong. Kitsa is a 1-3 with Vigilance and Prowess with a tap ability to draw and discard. This is clearly a fantastic looter, since you can both attack and activate the ability. Having Prowess means it works well in a spells deck, and serves as both a utility card and an attacker. Honestly, this card would be quite playable if that was it, however for 2 mana and tapping it, you can copy an instant or sorcery you control, as long as Kitsa's power is 3 or greater. Getting it there is the challenge, as you need 2 prowess triggers, or something like an equipment or buff spell. I'm not sure how often you will get to activate this, but it's definitely very nice to have. If you're only looking to have one looter in your cube, it's definitely competitive with Jace, but it also competes with other popular blue 2 drops like Ledger Shredder, Malcolm, and Duelist of the Mind that do similar things. Essence Channeler is an awesome card for a life gain theme, but it does a lot more than that. On first glance, this looks like a slightly easier to cast Voice of the Blessed, even down to the possibility of flying and vigilance. Whenever you gain life, you put a plus and plus one counter on it, which is the same on both cards. But while Voice of the Blessed needs 4 counters on it to get Vigilance and Flying, Essence Channeler gains these abilities until end of turn if you've lost life this turn. Now this may seem difficult to pull off in white, but it's actually pretty easy in cubes in general. Fetch lands and shock lands are an easy way to lose life, and even pain lands get played fairly frequently. There's also Phyrexian mana with cards like Porcelain Legionnaire and Dismember, and you can even Lightning Bolt yourself if all you need to do to win is give this thing flying. On top of all of that, when the Essence Channeler dies, you put its counters on another creature. Voice of the Blessed just gains indestructible ones it hits 10 counters, but moving the counters to another creature is kind of like getting to live on. I think this card is cool for a life gain theme, just make sure you have enough ways to trigger life loss on your own terms. In a world of increasingly wordy and complex magic cards, Plume Creed Escort is shockingly simple, effective, and good. It's a 2 mana 2 1 with flying, and it has flash. When it enters, target creature you control gains Hexproof until end of turn. There are already plenty of spells that grant protection or Hexproof, but very few of them are also creatures. If you want a version of that effect that can also work towards winning the game, Plume Creed Escort is a great pick. This is essentially a generic Rattle Chains, which is a very good card in dedicated spirits decks. Likewise, this card will be good in any deck that has creatures that you want to protect, which I think is most blue decks that have a big old finisher creature. The new Offspring mechanic is pretty interesting, allowing you to pay more mana to make a copy of a creature when you cast it, except it's 1-1. In the case of Paw Patch Recruit, the base is a 1-mana 2-1 with Trample, and whenever a creature you control is targeted by an opponent, you put a plus and plus one counter on a creature other than that creature. For 3 mana, you get 2 of them, except the copy is a 1-1 rather than a 2-1. When this inevitably eats a removal spell, you can at least put a counter on something, and if your opponent targets other creatures of yours, the recruit itself could grow into a large threat thanks to having trample. With 2 of them out, it becomes very difficult to contain. The modal nature of this card means it bridges the gap between a faster green-white tokens aggro deck and a green-based mid-range deck. The plus one plus one counter synergy can't be ignored either, and it plays nicely with a lot of other popular cube cards. The only downside is that both the 1 drop and 3 drop slots in green are pretty contested already. I really like the infamous Cruel Claw, but I fear it might not make the cut in many cubes. It's high on potential fun, but it's a little ambiguous on power, and it does die to removal without generating value right away, but its ability might attract a removal spell very quickly. For these reasons, it might turn some cubers away from filling their precious Rakdos slot with this card. What it is, is a 3 mana 3-3 three, three with Menace, and when it deals combat damage to a player, you do some shenanigans. You exile cards from your library until you hit a non-land, then you may discard a card to cast that card for free. 
That sounds great, but the downside of course is that you have to untap with it after casting it and then actually connect with damage. Even though it has menace, it's possible this card never does the thing. That said, discarding a card is great for reanimation decks or any sort of graveyard theme. You could dump a reanimate target into the graveyard, or you could cast a giant one off the top. This card does go crazy with a tutor like Vampiric Tutor or Imperial Seal that puts the card right on top. This is almost a fair show and tell or sneak attack type of card, and maybe serves as a lower power level version of those cards if that's a deck that you want to support, or if you like that effect but think those two cards are way too powerful for your environment. Jackdaw Savior is a pretty good reanimation card with an interesting twist. It's a 3-1 flyer for 3, which is really solid, and whenever it or another creature with flying dies, you can return a creature with lesser mana value from your graveyard to the battlefield. It triggering off of itself is honestly really solid value on its own. Triggering off of other deaths is amazing, since it's always to the battlefield. Yes, flying is a limitation, but this obviously goes well in a cube with a flyer's theme built in. What goes real crazy is if you have evoke cards. Revelark, Moldrifter, Subtlety, and other flying evoke cards will love Jackdaw Savior. If you cast them for their evoke costs, you're getting a higher mana value death trigger most of the time. These are already common cards in cube, and this goes great in a cube that already runs them. Upheaval is a bit of a powered cube staple, but it can be a little much in certain environments, being either way too good or way too niche. But Season of Weaving may provide a more fun and balanced version of Upheaval that more decks would consider drafting. For 6 mana, you can choose 5 points worth of modes. 1 point to draw a card, 2 points to make a copy of a creature or artifact, and 3 points to return each non-land, non-token permanent to its owner's hand. Much like the Confluence cycle, this gives a lot of choice, but I think I generally enjoy this more than a card like Mystic Confluence. Nothing wrong with that card, I do like it a lot, but this just seems more fun. You can draw 5 cards for 6 mana. You can copy a creature you control, then bounce everything, while getting to keep your token. In fact, if you're doing a sort of tokens prowess deck, this is a really good board wipe allowing you to probably keep most of your board. Even making a token of your best creature and drawing three is pretty good for six mana. I like these modes and what the combination of them can pull off. And they're not just the same old countering a spell, but they are still what you'd expect from blue, and I look forward to trying it in place of Mystic Confluence. Fountain Port Bell might be a cool little card for lower power level cubes. Despite its humble look and the fact that you might have just overlooked it during previews, it offers some interesting decision points. For one mana, it's an artifact, and when it enters, you may search your library for a basic land and put it on top of your library. You can also use its activated ability to pay one mana and sacrifice it to draw a card. It's the kind of card you wouldn't mind seeing to smooth out your hand in the early game. Being an artifact, it's also going to be more appealing for cubes that might want artifacts to come into play or to go to the graveyard. The interesting decision point here comes because you can play the bell, then in response to the search trigger, pay to sacrifice it to draw a card. If you get a land off the draw, you can then choose to just not search for a basic. And then it's essentially like you cycled a card in your hand, paying two mana to get a land. If you do end up searching the land, you can then sacrifice the bell to draw it, making it essentially like you basic land cycled, which is pretty good. So yeah, I think this card may seem bad, but it's actually a good rate for what it does and offers more flexibility than you might initially think. But obviously super powerful cubes probably don't want this when there are a lot better options available. I think once Soul Herder was printed, we stopped needing more blink or flicker pieces for cube. That said, Dower Port Mage is another compelling choice. It's a two mana one three and when one or more creatures you control leave the battlefield without dying, you draw a card. You can also pay two and tap it to bounce a creature you control to its owner's hand. This is obviously great card advantage in blink decks, which did not need more card advantage considering it's in the colors of ETB draw a card. But it also plays nice with lots of blue bounce spells that maybe you want to target your own creatures with to save them or a mass bounce spell. It also gives you some level of protection against exile spells that your opponents cast. But it's not only good in blink decks as that second ability is very useful for control and tempo kinds of decks. You can throw a chump blocker in front of a big attacker, then return the blocker to your hand before damage happens. If you do want to find a spot for this, I wish you luck in deciding what to cut, because it really won't be easy. Scavenging Ooze, you've had an incredibly good run, but the new, better model just might be here. Keen-Eyed Curator is a 2-mana 3-3 with the ability to pay 1 generic mana and exile a card from a graveyard. 
And if you've exiled four or more card types, it gets plus four, plus four, and trample. So let's compare it to the use. The casting cost here is much more restrictive, forcing this into more of a green focused deck rather than maybe a three color mid range deck. Although, Lanamore Elves and the like, tapping for green is a reasonable counter argument. It might not be hard to get this out after all. However, the ability costs generic mana rather than the ooze's green mana, so the color requirement is only up front. At its base, it's a 3 3 rather than the ooze's base 2 2. However, the ooze can start growing larger much faster. The ooze can also gain life, which is not meaningless. Scavenging ooze can theoretically grow as large as the amount of creatures in each deck that end up in graveyards, whereas Keen Eyed Curator is capped to being a 7 7. But you might be able to achieve that sooner with the Curator, and it having trample is very important for actually ending the game. The other downside is the card type restriction. You'll need to consider how easy it is to get four card types in the graveyard in your cube. Cards that are artifact creatures or other multi-type cards will be of particularly high value, and in a perfect world you can get there with two activations off an Urza Saga and a Walking Ballista, but that's not likely to happen. This will definitely require testing to be sure which card is better. Keynight Curator is certainly a card to pay attention to though. Okay, after all that, I am now out of breath. Those are 10 cards from Bloomboro that I think will work well in a variety of cubes of varying power levels, but I know there are more. If you have any more cards you plan on trying, or you disagree with any of my choices here, please let me know in the comments. And if you haven't subscribed yet, please consider doing so. YouTube says that around 85% of my views come from non-subscribers, so if you're here right now, there's a chance that you're probably not subbed yet. I post cube videos like this for every set, along with more videos about cube philosophy, commander, and much more. So I will see you in the next video, I hope.